I'd like to acknowledge that this land that I'm sitting on today is Darawal land. And I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and those who are emerging to carry on custodianship of this land. And I extend that respect to those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. Right, so welcome everybody to this beginner's guide to colouring EM images. I'm Jenny Whiting and um, it's great to have so many of you uh, here today. Um, really, I want the, um, the title of this talk to add for effective science communication because it's anybody can colour an EM image in any way they like. Um, you can do some weird and wacky things, put them up on your wall and that's fine. But what I'm going to be talking about today is really how to do it for effective science communication. So let's get started with why colour enhance black and white. EM images. Well, we know um, that EM images are generated in black and white. That's just the way the instruments are, the beams are, there's no colour involved. However, we see in colour and we expect, our brain expects uh, things to be in colour and to conform to those expectations, coloured images give a more engaging, richer visual experience. Um, as you can see from this image on the right over here. Um, also, they can really increase the understanding of content. So if we look at this black and white image on the left, very nice, and you can look at it carefully, you can make out that yes, there is a cell coming around here sitting on top of this um, material underneath. Uh, that's made a whole lot easier if we colour the cell a different colour from the background and it's sort of much more striking straight away. So a lot of you in research will be collecting your images as data. This is your primary data, um, the results of your experiments or controls. Um, but I think it's really worth bearing in mind that they are effective communication tools as well. So they're great for journal and book covers. Um, they make really useful teaching um, aids and in explanate, helping your explanations in talks. For great for posters, they're really good for uh, helping with inspirational science outreach. And they're a great promotional tool for your institutions as well. You know, they may be on like the cover of reports or they may end up on flags and posters that go flooding or fluttering around your faculty. Um, to really show, um, you know, what gets done around the place. So and that's really, uh, that really helps to raise the profile of your research in your institution as well. So that's a really nice uh, thing to do. So really, uh, we also want to know what are we trying to communicate when we colour an image? Are you actually trying to um, communicate a concept that's wider than the image itself? For instance, you know, here we've got, it's an image of human sperm, okay? But what else might be, we be wanting to convey um, with that image? It might be that sperm determine the sex of the baby. So you might want to colour half the sperm cells pink and half the sperm cells blue, because at least in our Western cultures, these colours have implicit meaning. And that can really support what you're trying to say. It may be that you want to, convey the message that you can't tell the difference just by looking at them, so you might want to colour them all the same. Another approach might be that each one carries a unique combination of alleles to make each baby an individual, so you might want to colour each sperm differently. So think about using colour to reinforce the message that you're um, trying to put across because it really um, does make a big difference. So what colours do we choose? Um, I always like to start with asking the question, does the object have a natural colour at the macro scale? For instance, we've got, you know, it might be red blood cells or bone, leaves, steel or particular minerals, might have a colour just when you look at the, the bulk object. And is it going to be um, helpful to people's understanding if you colour that differently from that expectation. So, I mean, what would it be like if you coloured red blood cells green or leaves red? Would that really 
help. Um, now, you know, otherwise, if there's no obvious choice or you think you want to change it just a bit to, to emphasize certain points, do whatever you think works well and looks appropriate. But if we look at this image here, I mean, a lot of the biologists among you will know what that is, but um, imagine that you don't. Um, this color combination is probably not hugely helpful and neither is that one really when we really know that this is a pollen grain sitting on a grass leaf. So again, um, they're all very pretty, but this is the one that's really going to help to communicate the content of that image. So uh, looking again here, we, some of you will know what this is, but again, if you see something like that, it's often, you know, you might be thinking maybe it's something corallish under the sea, maybe, not quite sure. Um, but of course, this is a blood clot with the red, red blood cells, a white, white blood cell, and all these fibers of fibrin um, that hold it all together. So just having this makes it so much clearer to see what we're looking at. And really, I can't think that I've seen any images of red blood cells and blood clots looking like this. Um, so um, it's not always easy, though, to um, work out how to color things, because some things like, for instance, graphite and graphene, black, they're black. So trying to give the suggestion of black and darkness can be quite difficult. Um, and these images by Dr. Khalid al-Jamal, um, he's done, I think, a really good job in trying to suggest that darkness, um, but providing, you know, actually giving them some color. And you can see this here. This is actually an inverted image um, where he's turned it into the negative um, which actually helps give the sense of translucence and transparency and thinness to this graphene. So there are ways to approach things, uh, even when things are not necessarily, um, you know, they don't really help you. <laughs> so I also want to tell you a story about this image because I think it really helps to indicate um, the importance of colour choice. Um, one of the users of Microscopy Australia microscopes um, came, um, I was going to write a story about the work that he'd done on this new clotting mechanism that had been discovered. Great piece of research, really exciting. Used the SEMs to create this nice image. And he brought it to me. And so when you look at that, what is colour telling you, especially in conjunction with this headline here? Um, to me, that immediately says red blood cells, blood clot. Um, that's, you know, we just looked at a blood clot image. You may think, well, these red blood cells look a bit odd, but maybe that's part of the process that's happening in this new clotting mechanism. But the colour is really drawing you to these are red blood cells. Whereas the whole point of this um, thing is that these are not red blood cells. These are white blood cells. They're neutrophils. Um, held together by broken bits of um, platelet. So when I asked him why he coloured them red and explained my confusion, he went, oh, I just wanted to make them stand out. And yeah, that's great, they do. But I think by choosing that colour, there are all sorts of other associations that get made as well. So bear that sort of thing in mind when you're um, tackling a colouring job. Okay, so there are also cultural associations that go along with many colours. Um, in the West, for instance, um, pink for girls, blue for boys, it's a very long, you know, well-established stereotype, not one I'm particularly in favour of, but still it's well ingrained uh, in the population and can serve um, our purposes if we want to do some colouring, like I mentioned earlier, with the sperm. Red and orange tend to be warning colours, so scary, danger, you know, so um, from the, you know, traffic lights and things, green is good, go ahead, um, nice, safe, comfortable things are all nice colour. White is associated with purity in weddings. However, these are not always the same everywhere. 
Um, in China, for instance, red and gold are good luck, uh, and white is for death and funerals. So, for instance, if you look at the um, uh, stock market charts in the West, when stocks are going up and going well, they're shown in green. When they're falling, uh, they're shown in red. That's completely the opposite in China. Uh, red means that the stocks are doing well, and green means that they're not. So think about how your audience will respond to what you're doing. And also by choosing particular colors, are you helping or confusing the viewer? So if we um, move on now to what are some of the features of good coloring? I think the, one of the most important things um, is to understand your image and to highlight the features accordingly. Because, I mean, if it's coming from your own research, that is very likely to be the case and you will understand what's going on. But if you're coloring images for other people, other people's work, really make sure that you understand what's going on in that image so you can really do it justice. When you get into the programs, um, don't create hard edges where there aren't any. Um, and we'll come back to that later on, but sometimes, you know, things are a bit soft and fuzzy and a bit blur into each other. Don't necessarily think I have to create a hard edge because um, that really doesn't help. Um, make sure you choose colors that enhance clarity, aid understanding and look good as well. You really want them to look good. Um, think about using strong color changes for strong feature boundaries and subtle color change for subtle feature changes. Also, think about start your starting image. Obviously, you want a good image, um, but think about getting the highest resolution starting image that you possibly can. Um, that way, the final image can be used at a large size without looking pixelated. Um, there are upsizing programs that can do a reasonably good job, but they can only do a good job with a good starting material. So the bigger the file size you can capture in the first place, the better. Now, I'm just gonna go on about this for a little bit because I know a lot of researchers think, oh, it's a three megabyte file, it's really, really huge. Um, no, if you're talking in the sort of photo library, print, large image use space, a 50 megabyte TIFF file is your kind of starting point. So, don't, don't be scared about saving and capturing the biggest file you can um, to start with. So I just want to show some examples of some naturalistic sort of coloring that um, I think work reasonably well um, to give you an idea. This um, one up here is penicillium mold, um, that sort of gray, bluey colored mold that grows on old bread. Um, here we have um, the rear end of a spider showing the spinnerets and the silk being produced. So that's all kind of generally in keeping with the kind of brownie, tanny colors of spiders. Um, here we've got um, a ciliate uh, in this sort of transparent little case that it produces and this is uh, hiding away down there. It's found in pond water, so we've got this kind of, you know, we've got this sort of brownish suggestion of muddy pond water um, and this sort of um, glassy looking casing with our little ciliate hiding away inside. Um, here we've got a squamous cell carcinoma cell and it's been highlighted, um, as I mentioned, in these kind of slightly scary orange and red um, threatening colors, the sort of uh, giving that suggestion of dangerous cancer. Um, and it also really lifts that out from the background. So that's a really lovely example. This blood clot we uh, touched on before. And there's a TEM image here. I mean, a lot of what you talk of, you see are SEM images because they're so dramatic. But th what I'm gonna say in this presentation um, really, it applies equally well to TEM images. And this is one you can see here. This is um, red blood cells in a glomerular capillary inside a kidney with podocyte cells around. So um, again, reasonably naturalistic looking coloring happening here. So 
moving on here to what I've called misleading colouring can be quite fun and you might like the way it looks, but it really isn't helpful. Um, for instance, all these little crystalline stars here, all the same material. There is no reason at all from a science communication point of view to colour these differently. There's nothing different about these green ones from these pink ones from these yellow ones. They're all the same. So, you know, it might look like a bit of a flower garden. By all means, put it up on your wall. Not helpful for science communication. Here again, um, what we've done here is almost the opposite. The person, um, me in this case, because I needed to um, not use copyright images, but um, this is the feature that we should be wanting to highlight because this is this fossilized bacterial cell here away from the surrounding um, mineral. But, um, you know, it's been colored so that this front part is different from the back part, which isn't right. And we're not highlighting this feature at all. So again, it's understand your image content um, will help you to get away from this. And again, these, um, these sort of mitochondria here in these moth sperm um, cells, you know, these are all the same, um, but um, you know, they're colored differently. It's just really not helpful. This is just not doing justice to the content of the image. It's just not highlighting anything. It's just some pretty colors. And again, here, these shouldn't be colored differently unless there is some kind of gradient effect along this direction, which can, you might want to color them um, just slightly different shades of the same, but basically these are all the same. They should be colored the same. So, okay. <clears throat> okay, so we've got a bit of an overview on how to approach it, things to consider, but now let's actually um, look at how we actually do it. So I already said about taking the pictures, starting off with a good picture is obviously um, the best place to start. Um, taking pictures with and without scale bars is also really helpful. I know a lot of um, instruments these days do that anyway, um, but that's also really, really helpful. Now also think about the composition of your image. Um, take a range of images. For instance, I've just put this one down in the bottom here. This is actually a piece of fossilized dinosaur poo, which is quite uh, interesting. Um, but it looks to me, I want to see the whole shape of this thing. Is this just going to round off here or is it going to go off right off the screen and be a long, long, long piece? Or what is it going to look like? It feels truncated to me and I feel I'm not getting the full bit of information. Also, we've got the scale bar down at the bottom crossing over and truncating this bottom um, side of this um, object. So I always think it's good... Um, because we'll come to um, another issue later, which is being able to use cutouts. So being able to have a, an entire object that you can separate from the background and use as a floating object in um, publications and things is really quite useful. So um, even if you want to zoom in, that's fine. Zoom out, way out, but try and get one that gives you a nice, um, clear um, access to the entire object in your frame. Um, also, as I've already said, capture the highest file size possible. Think cover, think posters, think flags fluttering around campus, think side of a bus, you know, think big. So I'm going to um, talk about Photoshop. I use Photoshop. It's very popular and powerful. Um, and I find it's what suits me. There are, however, free alternatives. Um, GIMP, PhotoP, Paint, ImageJ and Fiji are just some. I'm sure there are many more out there that also do um, really good things as well. Um, Photoshop, if you're part of a university um, or a large institution, uh, you can often get Photoshop through an institutional license. So you might want to look into that even if you don't have um, a version on your own personal computer, um, you might be able to get access to it. So um, like I say, what I'm going to be talking about from here on, we'll be talking about Photoshop. 
um, but these other things are useful. So some important tips to get good results. Um, you want to set plenty of history levels. Um, I'm not going to give you an, a detailed run through of how to use Photoshop um, in general. Um, it's a massive program, huge amounts of um, capability, but um, you'll need to explore yourself, but I will, sh I will highlight the things that actually help you do colouring. When you start, you want to save a copy as a TIFF um, or as a Photoshop file, but don't save as a JPEG as you go along because this compresses the file, you're losing data, and every time you save, you're degrading your image. So make sure that the image is in RGB mode and is in 8-bit and adjust the levels to use the full range from black and white, and I'm going to go through that in a moment. Choose brush softness and size to match the edges that you're working on and make sure you save regularly as you're going along, especially at sort of um, critical landmarks as you're going. So now, levels adjustment. This is something um, that people often don't do and it makes a big difference to the image. You can see this image here. We've got all sorts of shades of mid-range of grey, but no full black and no full white, apart from in the scale bar. This image um, is the original version of what I showed you just before. And this is all very dark. There's no sort of light gray through to white. So that also needs some levels adjustment to really make it look its best. So what does this mean? It really shows you the dynamic range of the content in the image. If you go to levels, um, and I'll do this live later, you'll see that, um, this, this point here on the histogram is full black and this point is full white. And you can see we have a, bit, a little bit here and a bit here um, and then so a few dotty bits and then this part of the image. Now this black and the white are actually coming from the scale bar. We actually want to adjust the image part, not the scale bar. So if we select this section, we select this section that's just the actual micrograph and what we do is to drag these sliders in to the end where the actual information is. You see, having got rid of that scale bar, we don't have this black and white at the ends anymore, we just see the thing. So we drag this in and we get this nicely separated, much better contrast image for working with. Also the full tonal range in an image, you may have the full range there but it still looks a bit dark and you're losing information. I know this isn't an EM image, but that's okay. So if you can actually take the center slider and move it along to, sh to really highlight the features that you're interested in, um, that's another way to use the levels effectively. Okay, so what to avoid? All too often I see this when people try and color an EM image. The starting image is wonderful, lots of depth and contrast, uh, and it's like somebody's pulled across, just pulled across a net curtain across the um, image. It is coloured, but and you can still make out what's behind it, but you've lost all that beautiful clarity. We are not going to do that. So, the colouring part itself. I'm a big fan of using colour balance. There are many ways to do uh, add colour in Photoshop, and I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, channel mixer is another one that I know a lot of people like to use. It's not one I've really ever used and I'm not going to talk about that one today. Um, but if you like to do that, by all means, go for it. There are also videos out there that say, this is the best way to colour an image. And what I'm going to show you today is that there is no best way to do this. There are many different ways to do this and it does depend on the image itself. Um, okay, so colour balance is accessed through the image adjustments colour balance in Photoshop. It's really useful for colouring whole images, and also selected parts of images. Um, so if you only use the mid to mid tones, you can get a single colour and that's what I'm showing you here. But if you make full use of the shadows, mid tone and highlights, you'd get a slightly richer uh, image here. Now this is illustrated, this is the, the panel that will come up with colour balance, you've got your three colour sliders and here we've got your shadows, mid-tones and highlights. 
So if you go to shadows, choose some images, mid-tones, you can choose slightly different images, uh, colors rather, highlights, different colors. Again, you actually get a bit of separation and richness happening in your image. Okay, and then selecting components. There's many ways to do that as well. You can use a magnetic lasso, quick selection or magic wand tool, which are all up here in the Photoshop panel. Um, and then you can fine tune that selection with the quick mask, which is down here in the bottom, which allows you to paint in and out those edges to get it pixel perfect. Once you've got that, you can make a work path, save that work path, and then you can come back um, and do things with your selections um, as you go along and in the future. So selection in all, also enables you to do cutouts. Um, so this is um, the original image, um, but by doing a selection, filling in the um, background with black, um, you can do that. You can also cut it out, put it on white, you can rotate it around, hang it off corners, and it looks really useful. So bear that in mind. But you can see, because this is only part of an image, you can really only sit it against an edge, not have it free floating in the middle of your screen. Now, gradient maps are another way that you can uh, color images. They're useful for SEM and TEM images. I'm obviously showing you a TEM image here. Um, and they're really useful where there are strong tonal differences between structures. Um, now, I would recommend using gradient maps with restraint. Um, there are many that exist within Photoshop and other programs, um, but they, um, and many of them have many, many colors. Um, and there is the temptation to go a bit wild. Um, but I think these two images kind of show the effect. This one here are uh, showing these nice um, rosettes here. Um, I'm pretty sure they're the mitochondria. Um, and they really, uh, are, by using this gradient map, that you can see they're very dark structures. Um, they're really standing out, separated well from these sort of membrane structures and then separated again from the background. So that's quite clear and I think that enhances the image. Whereas this one, um, there's a whole range of different colors in there. Um, these features are shown in the lime green, but the adjacent features are in yellow. It's really hard to make out that difference. It's really not enhancing clarity. You get a clear difference from the background, but that is really not what we're trying to show. So, you know, I said, use them with care, choose the colors really carefully and um, use with restraint. So coming to the end of the presentation part of this webinar, I hope I've shown you that you can get more from your images and that colouring is a really powerful tool for communicating science and making them really work for you. Um, when you've got well presented coloured images, it can really help your research get exposure. It can help the public see science as more beautiful and less scary. Um, and it can really help to inspire a whole new generation of science students. So I've just put up here a couple of how-to videos um, because I'm not gonna have a chance to go through the fine detail of using some of these techniques. This one here, how to use clipping masks. Now this provides a good alternative to the history brush, which I'll talk about in Photoshop, which is one of the reasons I really like Photoshop. I'm a big fan of the history brush, but not everything does it. So this is really useful video from the technical point of view. Um, and this is about using the quick select tool at adjustment layers. Um, again, really useful from a technical point of view. Um, all I'll say is please consider what I've already said about choosing colors and um, using colors um, in this talk when you look at those videos, but hugely useful from a technical point of view in how to use Photoshop. And for a bit of coloring inspiration, check out the Micronaut um, website. This really is the ultimate in, in SEM coloring. This guy takes, you can take a month to do a single image and they're really special works and um, yeah, really good inspiration. Don't be put off by how, how amazing they are. There's lots of easier you know, ways to get some good looking images without all of that. But again, amazing. And of course, Dr. Google is, um, also wonderful for getting some inspiration. 
Okay, so the images that I showed in, in this presentation are mainly for, uh, largely from Microscopy Australia facilities and our users. Um, but we've also got these other ones here that I've accessed um, through Welcome Collection and um, from Wikimedia Commons. So what I'm going to do now is to switch over my screen to Photoshop and take you through actually doing some of these things. So back to this image again. What I want to do is to show you again how to adjust these levels and then how to give this a simple colour using an adjustment layer. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to choose this rectangular selection tool. I'm going to come down here and select the image away from the scale bar. Then most of the adjustments that we're going to do happen in this image tab, which is uh, you're not going to be able to see that, unfortunately, but it's the image tab on the Photoshop. When you drop down and come to adjustments, level will sit in there. So we're going to get the levels and you'll see this is the histogram that I showed you in the presentation. We slide these sliders along here and that way we go okay and there we go we have a much better contrasted image. So I'm also going to make this uh, go onto the um, full screen there. Now we have this layer over here. Now if we come down to the bottom so this is in the layers window. We come down to the bottom, we can select uh, where is solid color here, and this will put a layer of color over the top, which looks terrible, but um, we're gonna fix that. We're gonna go, okay, we wanna color this. Uh, actually, no, I'm not gonna color it in red. I'm gonna color it in a sort of a goldy color to start with. So we go do that. Now, if we come over to this layer thing, and this is the blending mode, so we want to actually scroll down. You can see all the different effects as I scroll down, but what we're actually looking to get to is color at the bottom. So we select color. The color information from that color that we chose is uh, applied um, as a gradient, essentially, across this image. So the advantage of that is you can double click on this colored part here and then choose a different color along this thing. And then you can also click into this to choose any color that you want. Um, does, just have a good look as you go because they don't always work equally well. So have a good look. I'm going to go okay. That's fine. Um, I then that save that and that will be Done. So that's a very simple way to colour an image like that. I'm going to come to show you an alternative one a bit later on. Now, this one here is our bone image again. Um, I want to show you um, two ways to do this. Um, there's the colour balance method I was talking about. So I'm going to do that. Come to now. The other thing we need to do is, I say we already checked that we're in RGB mode, so that's good. We're going to come down here to color balance. Now, I'll show you what I'm meaning here. Now, I like to start off with the shadows. Now, if you use a dark color here, like red or blue, if you watch the colors in the shadows, you'll see that if you go a bit dark, you start to lose detail in there. Um, Whereas if you go for the lighter colours, um, it's not always essential, it depends what you want to do, but just beware of losing detail in those shadows. Um, I'm actually going to make this slightly greenish in the shadows, just because that's what I did before. Come to the mid-tones, add a bit of sort of pinky, uh, reddish um, tones here, maybe a little yellow as well come into the highlights and maybe add a little bit of cyan and a little bit of pink to that. You could obviously fine tune that a lot, but you can see what I was talking about before with this difference between slightly greenish shadows, slightly pinkish highlights, um, and a generally bony looking color. So I'm gonna say okay for that. Now, if I um, actually go back to revert, 
<clears throat> that to its original black and white and show you we can also do that as we did with the previous um, one. Uh, actually, I won't bother with that one. I'm going to just go straight on um, with this levels and colour balance because you could do that the same way with that um, colour picker that you did. Um, we did in this first one with that adjustment layer. Now, this is a beautiful image. I do love it. Um, it's uh, an image of um, hairs on a bee abdomen. Now, it's beautiful soft greys, and, and as a black and white image, that is rather lovely. But for colouring, I really want to get the maximum um, dynamic range, so we're going to do this levels adjustment again. So you see this black and white here. We want to lose that, so we're going to select the rest of the image. We're going to check, actually, this is a grayscale, so before we go any further, we're going to move that into RGB. Um, and then we're going to go to the levels. And again, we're going to bring these into the ends, like so, and OK. Now, trying to, um, we want to, I mean, I would want to um, select these feathery hairs, a different colour from the background, but trying to select those is a terribly challenging job. If you wanted to, you could, but uh, a quicker way to do it would be to again make use of our um, colour balance. Um, and in this case, because the background is quite dark and the hair is quite light, so I'm just going to use the shadows to colour the background. Now I'm colouring a bee abdomen here, so I'm going to try and make this a bit brown. A uh, little bit of red, a little bit of green, uh, maybe a little bit, little bit of yellow, maybe a bit more red in there. That's looking quite a nice sort of brownish colour. Then I'm going to jump straight to highlights and look at maybe making these a little bit Yellow, don't want to make them too yellow, maybe a little bit of cyan in there. Um, maybe back to shadows to give that a little more red to make that browner again. And you can see we've already got an image where the background and the hairs are quite nicely distinguished and we've colored them separately. So I'm going to okay that. Okay, now I want to move on to using a gradient map. Now coming back to this image because gradient map would be another way to go. So we're going to start off again with our adjust our levels. Um, now we're in RGB colour so that's good. We're going to come to levels. We're going to adjust these levels, bring this into the ends of the information. That's good. And now again, image adjustments, and then down here to gradient map. Now, um, you can see that if we click on this slider, there's a whole range of different gradient maps. And you can see some of them, like I was saying, have a huge range of colors. For this image, I mean, I'll show you the effect of doing that. See, that is just completely crazy and completely unhelpful. It really isn't helping us um, to distinguish these droplets um, at all. So let's just work our way through a few of these. That's quite good. Uh, oh, that's not so good. That's also not so good, although we could potentially, there, under there is a reverse, you'll see reverse. That's not too bad, but we're losing a lot of detail there. I'm not happy with that one. Um, I think uh, there's that one, let's reverse. That's quite good. I'm quite liking that. So let's um, have a look at this and how we can do this. So if you're happy with that as it is, that's not too bad. But what we can do is double click the gradient and we can actually edit this gradient a bit. So for instance, we might want to add a dark color to this end. So I'm going to keep that one in there, move it along a bit and actually add another color to that here and make this a bit darker. There we go, and we can see that. We can add that on the end. Um, that's already given us a bit of depth in this background. And what you can do with this is to move these along um, until it's 
uh, and the halfway points as well can be quite useful to move these backwards and forwards um, until you get um, an image that you're happy with and the colours that are really defining the features in your image. So I'm going to say for now that's okay. Obviously you can spend a lot of time to get these just right but we're going to go that's okay. Right, so these were ways of colouring images where you're colouring the whole image even though you're showing features in this case they're not really selectable because they're continuous, they're little lumps in the background that then turn into bigger droplets over here. So we're still approaching that as a single image colouring. When we come to an image like this, for instance, um, you know, fantastic image, really nice that we can do something special. We want to highlight um, this um, particle, this sphere, uh, and these other spheres away from this background and really make it pop, um, we can do that. So the way we're going to do that is to make a selection. So first of all, we're going to come back to our image tab, and check our mode, you can see we're in grayscale, we're going to change that to RGB colour. We're then going to come down to um, our adjustments, get our levels right. Now this little blip here, you'll know you, this is the white. You can see we've got white in this rather ugly scale bar. So we can ignore that safely, bring that into the end of the image data here and that's already looking better. Um, there's also a nifty tool I might just tell you about called the Healing Brush, which is in Photoshop. Use that here and we can magically get rid of this rather unsightly uh, scale bar. Ew, that wasn't working very well. What's going on there? That wasn't meant to do that. Let's undo that and um, maybe we'll do that a bit later on. That worked perfectly before, but um, we will come back to that. Okay, so what I want to do is select the, all these spheres because Assuming, uh, as I am in this case, that these are all the same material, um, we want to colour all these little spheres the same colour. So up here, we have the quick select tool. Now this is sitting um, here. So we're going to add the selections as we go. Um, so we want our brush. Um, I want to make this a bit bigger because um, we can go along here. So what I'm doing is drawing my brush over this area and you can see we've got, we've picked up that. Uh, I'm now going to pick up that and, oh, not that one, undo that. I'm going to make my brush smaller again. Now you can see our brush isn't really totally hard, so we've got, um, because I don't want super hard edges, but I'm going to bring this down, bring it down a bit more, and we can pick up some of these uh, little uh, particles here. Uh, now I'm going to go down smaller again, and I'm going to zoom in using... Um, that command C. If you look down in the bottom corner, you see we're at 66% and um, I want to be at 100% to make sure that we're getting all these little balls. Um, click back on my, uh, see, uh, right, so I'm going to click on some of these little guys. Um, obviously, if you were doing this properly, you'd go through carefully and pick out all the tiniest ones for best effect, make sure we get that little bit, this little bit here, uh, this little bit, and I'll do it quite roughly because um, we, you know, we don't have all day. Um, but obviously, if you were doing this yourself, you would want to make it look as good as you possibly could. Um, so if we go a bit over, we can always take that bit out uh, with the negative. So we're adding in what we do or taking out what we've done. So I want to go back to adding in here. Um, 
doing uh, this, this little one. Okay, um, I'm going to leave it leave it there. Um, obviously, um, well, I could go and, like, keep going and going, but I'm not going to because I don't want to um, take up too much of your time. Maybe that one. Okay, so what we, uh, I see we've missed some over here. We want to make sure we collect that. So if we go around with an eye to um, making sure that this is where 100% really matters. We really want to have a good look around the edge, but we're not, I uh, want to make sure I get that bit on there. Um, that we're not missing anything that should be included. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. So what I'm going to do now is switch over to the Paths tab and make this selection a work path. So this comes up, keep this number as small as possible, half is as small as it goes, and okay. Okay, and then on this little tab at the side, we save path. Now, okay, now that means that we can come back. Um, I'm gonna put this back down to fit on screen so you can see all the little things that we've selected here. So what I'm going to do is to make this back into a selection. So we click on our path and we see this thing that looks like a little selection thing. We can click on that and we can see our selection. Now, so we can color our selected bits separately to our background. So I'm going to look to um, do this with, I think, a uh, color balance. I'm going to make this into a sort of greenish color. So I'm going to make my mid-tones green. I'm going to make those shadows a bit yellow to give it a bit of punch. Um, maybe a bit more green happening, a little bit of yellow. And our highlights, again, I'm going to give them a bit of more uh, yellow to make this quite vivid, limey green. Okay, that's a good place to start. Um, what I'm going to, what you can do now, once you've got a selection, you can actually go to the select tab at the top here, go down and go inverse. So that will select everything but what you just had. So what I'm going to do now is go back to my uh, color balance um, and try something a bit different. I'm going to try making this more of a purplish color which is looking rather nice. I do like that. Could be considered sort of spacey or possibly velvet cushiony. Um, so I quite like that. Let's just see what we can put a bit of, maybe a bit of blue, take that into the pinker a bit, I think. I'm quite happy with that, especially for this. Okay, so I'm now thinking you can actually click off the selection and see what you look like. Generally, I'm thinking that's looking quite nice, um, but I really want to give this a bit more of a punch so we can take that path, put it back to a selection. Um, I might just go here. Um, hue and saturation is another nice way to go. Um, we can change the hue here. So it's like, okay, maybe, um, we want to go that way. We can change the color of just this by changing the hue slider. I'm actually quite like that greeny color that I had. But for instance, if we might go, okay, well, actually we want to make the outside a bit more yellowish and keep the green on the inside, then we can, what we can do, and this is where I like the history brush, is to change it to what we want to make the outside Go OK, and then down here at the bottom in this little thing, you click that checkbox for the for the history brush, which shows that you're choosing this this um, feature to work with. Click back to there, and over here at the history brush, 
we can, oh, that's too big. We need to make that a bit smaller. We can start to paint. Now, I've got a low opacity and a low flow here. I'm going to put that up a bit to about 50%. Um, and you can see that we start painting in. And um, because we've got that selected, it doesn't matter if we go over the edge there, we can start to paint in the outside of this. I'm doing this very quickly and not very... Um, so as we've got a 50% opacity, you do a couple of um, um, passes um, to get the full intensity here. Right, um, I'll say I'm not doing this at all carefully just to show the effect, but we, we can see we can then alter that. Another thing to do um, is brightness and contrast is to brighten this up a little bit um, and that um, can really make that much. So we could continue to work on that um, to make that really uh, good. But I think for what I wanted to try and show you, um, this is looking really nice. So I'm just gonna try this healing brush once more because um, Content aware, um, that's what we want. So I'm just going to try this again because, um, no, nope, hang on, let me just get rid of that selection. I'm going to go back to this healing tool and see if it's going to work for me this time. I don't know why that's not working. Okay, well, normally that can be really useful, but um, I'm thinking that there's something not quite right up here and I haven't got time to sort that out. Okay. So the next thing I want to move on to, and this is the last image that I want to demonstrate, is this lovely little lungfish embryo. So this one here, um, I'm going to use a, um, going to show you a different selection tool, which is the magic wand, which is this one here. Um, you can adjust the tolerance here. So if we click this, hold down shift, we can just work out, oh, we don't want to do that. In fact, I might actually, I think it might be easier to show you to go back to the, the spot, um, the quick selection tool here where we're adding, I want to make this brush way bigger. Up here. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to get rid of that and come back to this quick selection tool, brush around here, we'll fix that up in a minute. Come around here and fix that. Then we're gonna to go to the minus and then we can come around here and make that more accurate and all this around here. Okay, so again, I'm gonna come down into my 100% zoom in um, to my 100% so we can have a look here at what we've got. So, um, right, so that's looking good. Coming around. Uh, okay, we've missed a bit there. I'm going to put this brush down again to make sure that we can get what we need. Um, let me do that. Coming along here. Okay, we've got um, our mouth here. We want to get those edges a little neater. Edges a little neater there. Okay. Moving around. Now you can see here, I hope you can see here, that there's a little bit of halo around it. So what we can do with that, um, we can expand a selection or we can just, um, we can add a bit, um, a bit more. Oh, no, sorry, going the wrong way. Um, I should be taking it off because I'm on the outside. There we go, we can make that a bit more that way. The other thing you can do when you do a selection like that, um, uh, in this case, this will be fine. I'm not going to go back to fit on the screen. And 
uh, oh, that's not good. We need to take this little bit out over there. Oh, that should be going the wrong way around. I need to add that. There we go. That's better. Right. So, what we want to do now is um, I'm going to actually go into the edit mode and I'm going to fill this um, thing with black like that. Okay, so that's really lifted it out of the background. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to make this into a work path like I did before and save that work path. Um, save path and there we go. We've got that saved nicely. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I want to show you how to do um, a bit of work where we can paint on some soft um, effects. Embryos um, are more advanced at the head end than the tail end and I want to emphasize that. So I'm going to start by coloring, um, we'll get our mode in the right RGB first, come down into adjustments and go back to color balance. So I'm going to start making, start off making him a bit sort of pinkish um, with my, um, Oh, hang on. Did anybody see what I did wrong? I need to select the inverse here. Uh, to select the little critter. There we go. Uh, right, so now we're going to come back to these adjustments down to color balance. Uh, I'm going to make it a little bit pinkish, a bit kind of there, I'll give a little bit of um, yellow maybe into those highlight, uh, into the shadows and again, make a little bit of pinkish in the highlights. Okay, so you can get that right. So this is gonna be the color of the head. I'm gonna go, okay. Now what I want to do is show you, I want to make this, this end more greener. So we can come back here, come down to our hue, move this along. So we're looking at the color that we want the tail end to be. It will apply, so I'm gonna make that kind of more greenish. So I'm gonna go about there, go okay. Then we use this history brush. So we check our history brush in here and come back to this. Choose our history brush from our tool palette. And now, because I want to do a lot of gradient-y work, I want to put this down more around the 25% um, and get a brush that's going to um, be a bit bigger. And I don't want total softness, but yeah, actually I do want total softness. We'll do this. So now I want, you can see it's starting to check. Oops, sorry, uh, let's close that. I don't know what happened there. Right, so we want to start to turn this green and we can see it takes a little while because it's gonna take about four passes for that 25% um, to give us. So if you keep clicking as you drag, it gives you, a, it's like a fresh pass each time. So we can keep doing that um, and come down with our lowest. Um, Uh, here, I'm going to get a smaller brush to get in in here, uh, go around that edge. Um, I say I'm doing this really roughly because we don't have a lot of time, but um, keep clicking, it's going to come through greener. Fill in these little bits with the smaller brush and get this, uh, get this happening. Okay, and around the head, again, I should be doing this on 100%, this is 200%, but that's good. You can really see these corners that you want to get into. So this is why I say do it at least 100% so you can really see where you're going. I'm not going to spend too much time though for this demonstration, but you can see why you really want to be able to work carefully into those areas along here. Okay, so let's come down again. 
All right, so I'm going to put my brush back up again because I'm going to a bit more, a bit more again, because I really want to now start to suggest the greenness coming around into more anteriorly in this embryo, but not too much. So just getting a bit of a suggestion. Oh, I see got a bit of a green line there. I'm not quite sure what happened there, but ignore that. Um, okay, so I've got a bit of a suggestion of it coming a bit greener around towards the anterior. Maybe a little bit in there. Just a little bit in there. Okay, but the greener is stronger toward the back. Now, I want to show, okay, this is probably the dorsal, dorsal fin here. Um, so I'm thinking we want to change that. So let's get our adjustments, come back to hue. Maybe let's make, see if we can make this dorsal fin a bit bluish. Okay, a bit blue, that's good. Uh, okay, go back with our history brush, check the history brush box back here. Uh, now I need to make sure that my brush size really kind of matches this. Now I'm going to paint around over this dorsal fin area here. Um, um, we can go over the edges because we're only working in the selection. And so we can really um, start to put this kind of gradient again down the dorsal fin, we could make the, the anterior part much darker, much stronger. Of course, I'm going over there, but ignore that. Uh, and then coming down the back, um, we could, if we wanted, have it sort of fading out slightly. Um, Again, as it's really not as developed, say, I'm not sure if that is the case, but if it was not so developed down the back, we could um, fade that out a bit. We could also change this color here because I think this is the side fin. But again, I'm not really sure. I'm, I don't understand this image well enough. And before I did this properly for anybody, I would make sure that I know exactly what I'm doing and what these features are and what features need to be highlighted. But this is more of a technical demonstration of how to approach this kind of image. Okay, so we've got that happening here. Um, we can also uh, just quickly, again, hue and saturation. I wanna get something red to indicate some sort of inside mouthy kind of structures. Um, let me come across where something, I'm going to get something, okay, anything, where's a good colour, okay, about here, okay, again, history brush, back, I want to make this kind of, I'm going to make this opacity up so it, and uh, now a bit, so it's a bit stronger, get a bit of a suggestion of inside of the mouth or you might want to do the whole mandible here um, to illustrate a bit of alternative structure. Um, you could choose a different colour for the eye but I'm just saying you could do that as well if you want. So you can see there how we can use um, all these different components to really put together um, a subtle um, uh, coloured image that really can highlight different features um, but also keep it subtle where it's not obvious where there's distinct outlines. So I think um, that is where I would like to end this demonstration and I hope you found it useful. I hope it's not been too fast. I know I've whizzed through it terribly, terribly quickly um, but I'd now like to um, stop sharing this and open up um, for questions. Um, question, okay. For selecting components, which feature do you use in combination with the magic wand? Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what the question is for that. Um, I tend to use, um, 
when I'm actually clicking the magic wand tool is to, um, uh, let me see, I'm just going into it myself. Um, so I can see there's the tolerance is, um, is a thing that I, um, that I use to adjust what's being picked up and what's not being picked up. And we, along with that, hold down the shift key to add my future clicks into the, into the selection that's building up. Um, also, whether you check the contiguous box, which means that it's selecting all the bits that are adjacent um, to, um, to where you click that is of a similar tone. So that's a good way to go. But um, often backgrounds and things are really not amenable to that kind of selection. So um, I hope that's answered your question. Um, let me see, um, do we hold more webinars? Um, uh, we have quite a lot of videos um, up on our YouTube channel. We are holding some videos about SEM sample preparation. There are videos up on our YouTube channel, so you might like to check that out. Okay, what features you suggest for SEM images for microneedle and skin layers? Ah, oh, well, <laughs> I'm rather hoping that um, you would um, have got some ideas from this video. Um, I think microneedles, I think you'd want to be highlighting the microneedle quite strongly from the skin layers. I'd be looking at doing um, the skin layers in reasonably naturalistic colors um, and using for the microneedle, it depends what you're trying to communicate, of course. If you're trying to show that these are tiny, they're pointy, but they're not very scary, don't use red. If you want to show that they're sort of hard and spiky, maybe a red color for the microneedles, but I think that's probably not usually what you might be wanting to convey. Maybe something like um, a blue or a green that contrasts against the naturalistic skin tones would work nicely. Um, or you could use the colour that it actually is, um, but that might not make it very distinguishable from the skin tone. So think about those things. Try out a few things. You can do a lot of experimenting. Just make sure you save versions and save as so you can come back and change it. Especially once you've got selections it's a, and made it work paths, that's a really good time to save. Then you can just come back and change things if you are using... Um, those adjustment layers, uh, again, you can change colors and, and try out different things. So um, that was good. Um, can we do this uh, coloring in TEM images of new materials like that? Of course you can. You can color images, um, yeah, of whatever you want. Um, but you know, it's really a matter of choosing the colors that you think are really going to um, work to um, illustrate your material. You know, battery materials um, are fairly abstract. I think people don't necessarily have an expectation of what color they might be. So you can really choose colors that are gonna work um, to create something quite dramatic. Um, you, Think about, again, those messages. Is it going to be helping solar, uh, store solar, for instance? Potentially, you might want to choose yellowy colours or greenish colours to indicate green energy uh, or solar, sun, yellow. They would be things that would spring to my mind. But there's really, it's a matter of experimenting because it needs practice to do do all these things. So really um, just try things out. Make lots of versions, make versions for different different um, applications. Um, so really, uh, I hope if you've got some good images with some great research content, then it's perfect to be practicing on and try some things out. Um, okay, question. Why is it useful to use low opacity when coloring in different features? Okay, um, it depends if you're, uh, particularly in an image like that last one I coloured where you want to get a bit of a soft continuity of colour, um, then using a low 
opacity means that you have to go over it several times to create the full effect. Um, therefore, that also gives you options to create more of a gradient effect. But if you um, just want to colour something in a distinct colour, then there's no reason to use a low opacity. It just gives you a bit more flexibility, especially like with that embryo, you want to imply a gradient or if you want to um, just like some of those images that you saw at the beginning when there was some parts of it were darker, say a redder and going into an orange colour. If you do that with a hard edge, it will look very odd. If you do it with a low opacity, it lets you to go backwards and forwards a bit to really um, get more of a, a subtle effect. So, but try it out, try different opacities um, and try just like save lots of versions and try things out. That's the best thing I can really suggest. Um, okay, do I have any comments about converting to CMYK for for print? Um, yes, it can be a big pain. <laughs> um, RGB obviously gives a vibrance to images. Um, if you are colouring things uh, for CMYK printing, um, vibrant blues have a big problem. Um, so maybe try and steer away from those really beautiful vibrant blues, which is a pain because they're so beautiful. Um, but uh, Yes, I don't know. Um, is my colleague Susan Warner here? She is our print expert and she may have some more comments that she would like to add to that. If you can unmute yourself, Susan, um, would you like to add more comments about um, colours that you might choose if you know it's going to be converted to CMYK for print? Yeah, so basically CMYK, can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, yes, good. Uh, CMYK has a much smaller gamut of colours that you can recreate on it. So one of the elements in RGB is actually light, and the light behind your screen is what is giving you those vivid greens and blues, which you can't reproduce in print because obviously there's no light behind a print object. Um, so as Jenny said, blue and green tend to be the colours that suffer the most from this but reds tend to come out really nice, yellows, warm colours. So if you can kind of focus on those a little bit more, they tend to be better for print. Thank you, Susan. I hope that's answered uh, Kevin's question. Um, okay, uh, another question. My question is how you scroll and move the image while selecting through the selecting tool. Okay, yes, I didn't actually explain what I was doing there. As I'm doing the selection, I, what I then do is click the space bar and drag the image around. So then once you've dragged it, you can let go of the space bar and continue with your selecting tool. I find that's actually um, really easy and it becomes second nature um, after a while. Um, so yes, that, that's, that's easy. So just try that. So you start doing your selection and then if you want to move the image, click the space bar, just drag the image, let go of the space bar and carry on selecting. Okay, someone here is, can I share the procedure for Fiji or a link for a tutorial? I can see if I can find one. I'm, I'm not a Fiji user, but obviously there are a lot of Fiji users out there. Um, I'll see what I can find, but probably the best way would be to try Googling. Um, I know Fiji tends to be used a lot for the confocal um, image analysis side of things. Um, it can be done. Uh, you can do colouring in Fiji. Um, but I, I, when I was actually checking out just to make sure that that was the case, I didn't actually find much. So I might talk to a colleague of mine who's currently actually... Um, on extended period of leave, but when he comes back, um, I think he has done some um, tutorials in the past with a certain um, application of Fiji for black and white images. So we can see if we can find something there and um, maybe share that. Um, okay, do I think that GIMP can do pretty much the same? Uh, Yes, I do have GIMP. I haven't actually tried colouring images in GIMP, but it does have capacity. I personally really like Photopea. Um, 
it is it's a free online version very similar to um, Photoshop the only thing is it doesn't have the history brush but they're those other um, tools that can be used with the clipping uh, clipping um, layers that um, are in those uh, videos very nice um, so uh, yes, so photo P I really like. Um, I like I say, try it out in GIMP. If GIMP doesn't do what you need, um, try photo P. Okay, I'm working on fly ash and cement composites. All components are natively gray. SEM images show various features showing extent of hydration based on coverage, uh, homogeneity. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, Gray, I was actually going to demonstrate an image on, on um, gray, a cementy kind of thing actually. Um, maybe putting in some just suggestions of bluish colors with some other kinds of highlights. There are some of those effects that um, were in that blending mode um, brush that can give you some quite interesting effects. Um, so, I think, uh, and also, if there are other aspects, um, I mean, it doesn't. Ha they don't have to be the realistic colours. Um, you can sort of push that, um, you know, push that a bit. Maybe put in some highlights if there are um, features. You know, hydration, chemical changes. Maybe you know, if there are hydration bits, you might want to go more along the blue line for sort of associated with water things if there's um, oxidation things or if there's any iron or other minerals in there, you might want to go down the red or rusty color. Um, really, I think, you know, just, just experiment. Um, even you can make gray, still look kind of grayish, but with other tones underneath it. So it might be a more bluey gray or a more reddish gray or, you know, Again, you might want to add subtle differences in tone. Um, that might be somewhere, depending what structures you've got, um, if it's looking 3D rather than a polished surface, you might want to try those effects with the shadows versus mid-tones versus highlights to get a bit of richness in those colours. Um, that, that's what I'd be looking at trying. But, you know, you could... you. I say you don't have to do when you've got a boring grey thing. You you can get a bit more creative and add a bit more colour if you like. Do different versions as well for different purposes. So see what um, see what you can do. Also maybe just um, you could do a slight hue change and with a low opacity brush just paint a bit of um, you know maybe if you've got um, different crystal chunks or something just give a bit of highlight um, along certain features just subtly. Um, yeah, that, that's be the kind of way I would approach it. Um, but yeah, try. Okay, can I share any papers on EM colouring in materials science? Um, I could try and dig some out, but there don't tend to be a lot of papers. They tend to be more on, uh, one reason I did this was um, there's a lot of, um, technical videos and things out there on how to how to do you know this selection tool or that um, feature in Photoshop or whatever, but there's not a lot that really says um, how to you know how to approach things, how to use different uh, images and the, and the kinds of reasons for doing it. So um, yeah, can I comment on ways to pseudo color images using colorblind friendly schemes? Um, well, really, it would just be um, a matter of choosing the colours um, for the particular, um, if, if you're aiming at a particular person, um, find out what kind of colour blindness they have and use appropriate colours. Um, but yes, I think that would simply be a matter of doing research, uh, finding what colours are the most um, compatible with colour blindness and um, and use those colors. Yeah, that's, that's fine.